risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And welcome this morning as we continue in our Easter season. This is the second Sunday of Easter, and we have five more. And uh, normally it's the Sunday after Easter that is called Low Sunday. And uh, because people said, I worshiped last Sunday, but I'm glad you're back this Sunday, and here we go as we celebrate. And as we continue on with the stories of the, cell, uh, of the resurrection, and today we meet Thomas, the one we call the Doubting One. Thomas missed out that first Easter night. He was out, as uh, someone suggested this week, maybe out buying toilet paper or, or something like that, the groceries that he needed, because he was tired of being locked up. And that first night when Jesus arrived. But now he's with the disciples, the second, a week later, in the upper room. They're locked up, and here comes Jesus again. The Holy Spirit fills them up, and Jesus gave the Holy Spirit the first time. And they told Thomas about what happened, and Thomas wouldn't believe. He said, unless I see his hands and see him with the marks in his body, I will not believe. And now there stands Jesus, and he says, Thomas, it's me. Touch me. Do whatever you want to. It's me. And it was then that Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And today, that is our opportunity, too, to say, my Lord and my God. And I, and I don't want to miss out on that opportunity, and I don't think you do either. And our risen Lord is here with his spirit, with his body and blood. And we're going to see, we're going to touch, we're going to believe, we're going to confess as we gather in his presence for worship today. And may he fill us with great joy. So welcome, and he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us stand and sing the hymn before us. <laughs> Savior. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. 
in repentant faith. We come before our Lord in confession, and we say, Almighty God, we confess to you that we are sinful by nature. We have sinned by our selfish thoughts, our hurtful words, and our unloving actions. Our faith has often wavered as we demand proof of your love and care. Forgive us for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to us, God and Father, even our Lord Jesus Christ, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And as a call or ordained servant of the word, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection May by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. We pray through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings.
and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash round his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us stand and sing hallelujah.
It's been over two years. Have a seat and look at me. Here you go. It's been a long time, and I've missed you. And you know what? I'm a little afraid this morning because I might mess up because I'm not used to doing this. Do you ever get afraid? Are you afraid of anything? No? Wow. Not you. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. And today, we're going to talk about the disciples. Do you know what a disciple is? Yeah. It's scary. It's what? It's scary. scary? Yeah. Thomas? Okay. <laughs> okay, I got it. So the disciples were Jesus' followers. You heard about them. We just heard the story about them. And after Jesus rose from the grave, and we have the open tomb before us, where were they at? What were they doing? You remember? They were behind locked doors. They were afraid because they thought that they were going to come and get them like they did Jesus and nail them to the cross. Would you be afraid of that too? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be afraid. I don't want to be nailed to you. No. So anyway, the long story short is that Jesus is what? He comes into the room through the locked doors. He's God. He can do anything. He came back and he's what? Is he dead? No. He's, he's what? He's alive. He's risen. Yeah. He's uh, there. And he's in the midst of the disciples. Now, the disciples, we said, were scared. And you said you never get scared of anything? You're not scared of the dark? You're not scared of big storms? No? Boy, you must have nice houses then and lots of good people. Okay. We don't know. I, I get scared of certain things at times. But Jesus came and he took away their fear. They were excited and they got calmed down. And they knew that Jesus was always with them. And that's probably why you're not afraid, because Jesus is always with you too, isn't he? And then it says that, he, that Jesus came in, and he filled them, he breathed into them the Holy Spirit. Do you know who the Holy Spirit is? No. No. Okay, let's look, think about that. We have our one God, right? But when we begin, we begin in all our services in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of God. And the Holy Spirit is what lives in us so that we're able to say, Jesus is my Lord. Can you say that? Jesus is my Lord. And we can say that because the Holy Spirit lives in it. Now, I have a bottle of water here. And this bottle of water is going to symbolize, it's going to represent the disciples who are afraid. And they're all full of afraid and they're all locked up like this water is in the bottle. And Jesus breathed on them. Now, I have a straw here, and I can do two things with the straw. I can do what? I can sip it and get the water out, or what else can you do with the straw and the water? You can blow on what happens. Make a storm in the water, yeah. And we can do like this and go, oh! We get all wet and we can make a mess, and our mommies and daddies say, No, we'll never do that. But that's like having the Spirit in us. Because when the Spirit is in us, we overflow with joy. And that's what Jesus does when He lives in us and with us and through us. We became new people. We don't get afraid of anything. Jesus says, I'm walking with you today, and you have nothing to be afraid of. And I'm glad you already know that because none of you were afraid this morning. And so let's pray now. Can you fold your hands? Let's fold our hands. And repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me, for rising from the dead, and giving me the assurance that I am going to live with you Forever and ever. Forever and ever. 
And you take you know, what, yeah, you take away, take away all, the all the things that scare me. That scare me. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today and see you next Sunday, okay? Okay. And we continue now with our sermon hymn. Love to tell the story. trained and prepared for that one important moment and then we it happened and we hesitated and we missed our opportunity and then right away what happens guilt comes over us and failure comes over us because we let ourselves down and we let other people down and we felt worthless we felt foolish we even questioned who we really are well, when Jesus was crucified and died on the cross, his followers literally, well, they fell apart. They scattered and they were devastated. It wasn't supposed to happen that way. 
We followed him for three years. We watched him do miracles. We, he taught us. He mentored us. He challenged us. He corrected us when we were wrong. He, and we followed him no matter what. And now, now he died. And what would we do? What did they do? They ran away like cowards, didn't they? Some even denying him. And they became frightened. They became discouraged. They become dis disillusioned, defeated, and depressed. They hit rock bottom and they were running on empty. But three days later, Jesus came back to life. And go one more slide, please. There we go. And and uh, he went and he met the disciples. And what happened in that room changed those individuals forever. Those who were once cowards are now full of all kinds of courage. Those who were empty are now empowered. And those who were once defeated and discouraged are now confident and daring. And what happened? What changed them? How did Jesus refill their empty tanks? Running on empty. I know one person who doesn't run on empty. I don't know her name. I just know what she does because I found out the other week. I get my gas at Costco because I'm cheap and the gas there is cheap. <laughs> and it's cheaper than other places. And I'm in line and it's taking a while and the lady in front of me pulls up to the pump and she pulls out, puts the nozzle in, turns it on and 20 seconds later she's putting the nozzle back. I'm going, what? And then when she left, that's good, it didn't take long, so I pulled my truck up and I looked, she put in $2.69. I thought, what? And I asked the attendant who was walking by, I said, is this normal? And he starts laughing. He says, she's the first one in line every day. Every day she tops off her tank because she doesn't want to ever run out of gas. Some days it's only a dollar, some days it may be five dollars, so that's a big day. No, I wouldn't spend that kind of time in line. How about you? But maybe you're a person who, when the tank is half full, you go fill up. Or maybe you're a person, when it's a quarter full, you go fill up. Or maybe you're one of those people who think E means enough gas to keep on going. <laughs> but how many of you have ever run out of gas in your life? Yeah, it's no fun, is it? Usually after a high energy time, we all run out of gas and run out of empty. And that happens in the church. Easter, Holy Week is a high energy time, and, and that's why the Sunday after Easter is always called Low Sunday, because people are just running on empty. And a lot of times people stay away from church when they should be back in church, because that's where they get filled. Today, where are you? And it doesn't matter whether you're three quarters full or half full or a quarter full or even if your red light and E light is on, you need to fill up. And today we're going to look at how Jesus refills our tank, how he revitalizes and re-energizes us when we're running on empty. And let's be real, we all have been through some hard times lately. Some of you are still in hard times and struggles and, and, and you're wondering what's going on. You may have had thoughts like, I don't know whether I can go on anymore. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm ready to throw in the top. So if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling fatigued, fearful, or just weary this morning, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, I've got good news for you. There's a solution that's available for each one of us. And today we're going to look at the seven things that Jesus did with his disciples when they were at their lowest, and when they were running on empty. And he does the same thing for you and me. And so let's see what they are. The first thing is, Jesus does when he wants, he wants to refill our tank, is he meets us where we're at. The disciples were scared to death. They were hiding in that locked room. They were sure that something was going to happen to them. And they probably were second-guessing themselves. Were we wrong? Why did we really think that he was God? Were we deluded? Were we made fools of? And Jesus, what's he do? He passes right through those locked doors and he greets the people. 
When you're running on the empty, Jesus doesn't wait for you to come to him. He comes to you. In the midst of the disciples' self-doubt and questioning, Jesus just shows up. And what he did, they didn't recognize him. And why didn't they recognize him? Because they didn't expect him. In fact, that happens in our lives all the time, doesn't it? God shows up and we don't even know it. He shows up in circumstances and in situations and people and we don't recognize him. And why? Because we're not looking for him. So when you're running on empty, it can feel like God's a million miles away, but know this. He's here and he's near. And he's probably is the one who's carrying you through this day so you can make it to the next. Second, he gives you encouragement. One more slide. There we go. He gives you encouragement. He, the first thing Jesus says to them is, peace be with you. In other words, he's saying, calm down, guys. Chill out. Take a deep breath. Relax, because it's going to be okay. Because I've got it all under control. Jesus could have walked in that room, and he could have been how we probably would have responded. Where did your fools go? Why did you see me stranded? What, what kind of people are you? Weren't you following me? Would you let me abandon me? But he didn't criticize them. He showed them love. He didn't scold them. He showed them love. And he said, instead, he says, peace be with you. And why? He understood their confusion, but he also understands our confusion. The Bible says, do not worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need. Always giving thanks. Fact. We've got two alternatives in life. We can pray or we can panic. And let's face it, today there's not enough people praying and most of the world is panicking. We can worry or we can worship. Today we chose to worship. And God is saying, you don't have to worry about anything, but I want you to pray about everything. And God's peace, which is so great and that we cannot understand at all, will keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. No matter what you're facing, there's no need to stress because you're too blessed to be stressed because God is with you. Third, he shows you his love. When Jesus showed the disciples the nail prints in his hands and feet, he's not only identifying himself, he's showing how much he loves them in the world. And that's what that empty cross and the empty tomb and empty cloths all show us, that Jesus dying on the cross was the greatest act of love ever done for you and me. It's greater than anything moms and dads can do for their kids. It's greater than anything a spouse can do for their, their loved ones. It's greater than any, what any boyfriend or girlfriend can do or anybody else. No one will ever love us like Jesus loves us. If we see and understand God's unconditional love, no matter what's going on in our lives, even if it seems to be out of control and falling apart, we can take a deep breath. We can relax. Because our peace and our joy come not from our circumstances of our lives, but they come with our, from our relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus. What's the scripture say? We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Fourth, he offers forgiveness, and this is huge, my friends. Forgiveness is a huge re- Energizer, because the two things that cause us to run out of energy and drain us emotionally and physically are guilt and resentment. The answer to both is forgiveness. You can't be guilty and happy at the same time. You can't be resentful and filled with joy at the same time. And that's a problem because we live in an imperfect world filled with sin. We all make mistakes. We all hurt each other. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. And when I hurt you, I feel guilty. And when you hurt me, I feel resentment. And those two things, guilt over the things that I've done wrong in the world, 
for the things I failed to do and resentment over the things that have kept had, that have been done wrong to me. And it's been said that these two are called the twins that keep us stuck in emotionally empty positions. They drain the life out of us. And if we're ever going to be happy in life, we've got to learn to let it go. We've got to let God take charge. And there's only one way to do that. And it's called forgiveness. God has forgiven you and me. That's what the death on the cross is all about. And because of that, he expects you and me to do the same thing with those people around us. We have to pass it on. We've got to cut people some slack. We've got to show them God's grace. And if we don't, our guilt and our resentment will keep us on empty. It will keep us stuck in the past and prevent us from moving forward in life. So what do we need to let go of today? Who do we need to let off the hook? Our family, our friends, no. someone in, our, in the church. You say, I just can't do that. They hurt me. That's right. We can't, but God can. And that's why we need Jesus. We can't do it on our own power. Forgiveness is never earned. It's not easy. And it certainly isn't fun, is it? But it's what lets us get on with our life. And forgiveness is the key to happiness. Happy is the person whose sins are forgiven and whose wrongs are pardoned. Happy is the person whom the Lord does not consider guilty anymore. And because of the cross, because of the empty tomb, we have been completely forgiven and now we are empowered to share that same forgiveness with others. Fifth. Jesus fills us with his presence when we're running on empty. Jesus says, I don't want to just be with you. I want to be in you. Yeah. Then Jesus breathed on them, his disciples, and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He does the same thing for you and me. And what's the Holy Spirit? It's God himself. Yeah. It's God's power and God's presence in our life. Yeah. And when the Spirit came, the disciples realized they were no longer alone. God was with them all the time in a tangible way. Yeah. We may be alone, but I guarantee you we're never lonely. Yeah. And through the gift of the Holy Spirit, God says, I want to be with you every moment of your life. Hallelujah. And maybe it's sickness or the loss of a loved one or just life itself. And our emotions take us to places we don't understand. We think we can handle it, and then we can't. And when those waves of loneliness come on me, I pray, God, I need to feel your presence now. I need you to remind me that you're with me and that you're in me. That leads us to number six. The sixth thing Jesus does when we're running on empty is he gives us a new reason to live. When your life as you knew it, know it, knew it and your livelihood has been disrupted and even taken away from you, you begin to question who you are and what purpose you have in your life. A lot of times people are running on empty because they don't know the purpose that God has planned for them. They're doing what they think they're supposed to do or what will pay for their standard of living. But you and I were made for far more than money. We were made for meaning. So what do we do? We have to turn to God and let him do his thing and give us purpose to our lives. None of us are an accident. We all are part of God's creation, and each one of us is important. And all of us need something greater than ourselves that pulls us beyond these little self-centered, meaningless, shallow lives that we so often live. We need to discover what God has meant for us to be in the first place. And I guarantee you, it's something bigger than we ever thought. Did you know that God's plan for our life is greater than any plan we could ever think of? So often our plans are, yeah, this big. And we, but if we would let God have control in every area or courage, and if we would say, God, I'm yours, use me for your purpose in this world, because that's why you created me, I guarantee you, it wouldn't be this big anymore. 
And that's what Jesus did with his disciples. They were crushed, they were guilt-ridden, fearful, they were defeated. And Jesus comes to them and says, as a father sent me, so I send you. In a moment, he recharged their batteries. He lifted their spirits. He empowered their living. He knew they blew it and at the most critical time. And yet he never chastised them. He just simply says, I've got a plan. We're going to take it to the world and we're going to transform it. And they did. That little group of 12 has now become more than 2.5 billion people who claim to know Jesus is Lord. I think that's pretty cool. And that's God in that work. So let me ask you a question. Who are you living for? What are you living for? Are you waiting for God to, to move you or are you on fire for the Lord? Because now is the time to let God live in you. And we must take every opportunity that he gives to us to build the city, to build the congregation, to build the body of Christ, to change the culture that surrounds us and discover God, what God's purpose is for people's lives through this ministry that's called Holy Cross. And that leads us, and the choice is yours. That leads us to the final one. What did Jesus, the last thing Jesus did with his followers on that first Easter was he gave them hope. In spite of all their doubts and fears, Jesus gave them hope in themselves and in God. Thomas, known as Dominic Thomas, was the most honest, the most authentic of all the disciples. We read in Scripture how Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but Thomas said, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my hands into his side wound, I'm not going to believe. But now, a week later, that's where we find ourselves. The disciples were in the house again, and this time Thomas was with them. And, the, and this time Jesus comes through the same locked doors and he stood among them and there he said that again peace be with you that's the third time now he said it and he said to Thomas Thomas put your fingers in my hands see my hands reach out your hand and put it into my side go ahead it's alright go ahead and touch me but stop doubting and believe and Thomas said to him my Lord and my God Thomas had lost all hope. And nothing drains our tank more than the lack of hope. We've got a lot of things draining our hope. From the insecurity of the world system right now, job insecurity, lack of job, no health insurance, maybe the crime that surrounds us, failing health, mortality, the list goes on and on, doesn't it? And if there was ever a time when we needed hope, it is now. And the fact is, hope Real hope is not going to come from City Hall. It's not going to come from some elected politician. It's not going to come from the federal government. It can only come from the one who is and was and will always be. It only comes from Jesus. And so the truth this morning is God ain't dead. He's alive. And because he is alive, we can be people of hope today. And because of that glorious Easter resurrection, we can be recharged and we feel refueled every day. And because of Jesus' love, our tank will never be empty, even in the midst of all of life's troubles and failures, because Jesus lives. He is risen! He is risen indeed! Hallelujah! Amen. We stand as we confess our faith in this morning we use the words of the Nicene Creed. We speak the Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, before us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified. We spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And we pray.
let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious God, you are exalted over all things in heaven and earth. And in your mercy, you shower us with blessings of both body and soul as you care for your creation. Enable us to see your hands at work in our midst, that together with all those who share in the power of your Son's resurrection, we always can say to you and together we speak, you alone are the Lord and God, giver of life. You renew our souls through the power of your Holy Spirit as we dwell in the shadow of your wings. As we continue to celebrate the joy of our Easter, Savior's Easter victory, grant that your church on earth always speaks your word with boldness and confidence. That like the first eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection, we share with all people and together we say, You alone are Lord and God. You govern all nations with your mighty and merciful hand. You show forth your favor to the land in which we live, raising up men and women who will serve as godly leaders. And Lord, today we pray for our leadership seminar that will happen this afternoon for our church leaders here among us. Bless those who make and minister and judge our laws, protecting all those who serve in harm's way for the benefit of others, and helping us always to know and believe. And together we say, you alone are Lord and our Lord God. In your son's earthly ministry, people brought to him all those who were sick and suffering, that he might touch and heal them. This ministry of healing continues through his disciples and the earliest church. And even now we know that Jesus heals, renews, and restores through the means of grace. That he's provided for our benefit. And so place your healing hand upon those for who are in need, who we lay, bring before you today. We continue to pray for Linda Elizabeth, Emmanuel Holzer, Sandy Searcy, Charles Asen, uh, Fania, and Carl Moffitt, Bertha Johnson, Angel Escobar, Maria Gaetan, baby Nathaniel and baby Noah, those who are fighting cancer, Ron Shaver, Lori Hanser, Hatcher, Jasmine, Lisa Holder, Sherry Moe, and Greta. Lord, we continue to pray for Roy Robertson and Jennifer Belgium and family, Eric Pearson, Stephanie Hanna, Winston Benjamin, Maggie Hoffman, John Jordan, Clifford Ricks, Pat Ricks, Joan Milley Casante. And today we pray for the family of Pastor Storr, as Pastor Storr was carried to his heavenly home on Friday evening. And Lord, as he is now celebrating in heaven with you we give you praise for the life he lived and for how he touched our lives here and holy cross and other places in this world be with chelsea now and her brothers and sisters as they make plans for the celebration of life service that will happen in the days to come and we continue to pray for the war victims and refugees of the ukraine and soldiers and leaders in the shadow of your healing presence we boldly confess together you alone are Lord and God. Prepare the hearts of all those who receive you at your table this day, O Lord. Help us to cast aside all bitterness and pride, laying our burdens down at the foot of Christ's cross. Because he lives in triumph over death and the grave, we experience his life, giving presence as we are gathered in his name to remember his sacrifice. Grant that all who share in his body and blood look upon him, trust in him, and always say to him, say of him, and together, you alone are Lord and God. Today we give you praise, Lord, for accomplishments, for the gifts that you give to us. And we live up Samaria Popold, who graduated from, from college yesterday, and she's with us today. Lord, continue to walk with her and fill her and use her in your kingdom work and whatever you got planned. I know she's ready for that next step. And together we say, you alone are Lord and God. We bring all these prayers before you, gracious Father, in the name of him who is risen from the dead and reigns with you forever as our Lord and God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated at this time we take the offering. We also will be celebrating Holy Communion. If you have not picked up your individual cups yet, uh, our three packaged communities, they're on, on the narthex on the table. Please go get them at this time. We sing, Great Are You, Lord.
with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right and proper everywhere and always to give thanks to you, loving Father, holy and almighty Lord, eternal God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, but the center and chief reason we have to praise you is the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the very Passover lamb given for us, who has taken away the world's sins. And by his death he destroyed death, and by his rising to life he has restored to us everlasting life. And therefore with angels and archangels, the saints in heaven and those on earth, we glorify your name, ever praising you and singing. After the same manner also took the cup after supper, and when he gave him thanks, he gave it to him, saying, Drink of it all, because this is my blood shed for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And may this body and blood strengthen and preserve your true faith into life everlasting. Amen. And we join now as we sing on this day.
Pastor Storr's uh, celebration of life service, we do not know the time or date of it yet. The family is still working through process. We should know something by Tuesday, and we will send out an email, a text message, and also a phone tree. So listen to your phone tree, and because there's a good chance that it will be next Saturday morning. I'm not sure, but there's a good chance that it might be. That's what they're hoping for, but there's a couple of details because there are still 10 siblings uh, alive, 10 of his kids still alive, and they're all over the country. And so we're just trying to see what, what can work out. So I'll keep you posted. And by God's blessings, greet each other in the love of Christ, and it's great to have you with us today. God bless.